Well, Wanderin, it's good to see some new faces in the group and um, thank you for joining us today. Before I introduce today's um, panel, I just want to kind of thank um, Eleanor for setting up the uh, event at Hotel Marcel a few weeks ago, which was wonderful to see people out in, in, the, in the live, in the wild. And uh, I really like the way that this, um, this is a sort of a sequel in a way where we're talking uh, about how um, you know, we can democratise the investment of clean energy in Connecticut. And uh, as you all know, or probably know, you know, the US is 4% of the world's population, but consumes 24% uh, of the world's energy. So we have an enormous uh, opportunity gap, you might say, to uh, improve the way that we do that and the way we advance into um, a sort of a carbon neutral uh, economy. So we're we're really lucky today to have um, two really thoughtful thought leaders in this. Not, you know, you get they get a lot of attention of technology people building new hardware and, and software and stuff. But today, our guests are going to be talking about how to actually finance this kind of work and actually make it work from a financial point of view. Let's let's just introduce our, our panel for today. We're thrilled to have Jessica Brooks from Sunwell Solar and David Beach from uh, Connecticut Green Bank here to talk about their ideas, some of their operations, some of their successes and challenges in the energy production uh, in Connecticut and how we can do much better at it. And um, so I might take this opportunity just to welcome uh, Jess. Thank you, Glenn, and uh, and Eleanor and Conscious Capitalism for, uh, for inviting me to come and speak. Um, I'm Jess Brooks. I am Chief Development Officer at Sunwell. Um, I, uh, I am based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, but, uh, but my heart is in New Haven, Connecticut, where I grew up. Um, when we were doing the prep call for, uh, for this session, um, Eleanor asked uh, us to talk a little bit about how we got into this work. Um, and, uh, and my normal intro is that I got into this work by way of community economic development. Um, before I started at Sunwealth, I spent about 20 years doing, uh, doing community economic development. And, um, and for folks who are part of this chapter, this will not surprise you. Um, my aunt is Lindy Gold, who is a member of the Conscious Capitalism Connecticut uh, chapter, and she is a mentor to me. And so, um, so yeah, so I guess technically I got into this work by way of Lindy. Um, and, uh, and she makes me proud every single day. Um, I, uh, I, I moved over into this space because I saw in clean energy and particularly in the community-based solar market where SunWealth works, this opportunity to achieve a lot of the same goals that, um, that we were working toward in community economic development. Um, and in fact, I saw this like once in a lifetime opportunity to do it. Um, I also, um, I got into this work, I guess, more broadly um, because I'm a mom of two boys um, who I am raising in this world and I look at the world that they're growing up in um, and I feel like as a parent, I've got a responsibility to tackle two of the greatest challenges that the world is facing right now. Um, one is climate change and the other one is inequality. And uh, and I feel like we as a, as a generation have a real obligation to, um, to address both of those challenges, and um, and conscious capitalism is is part of the way we're going to get it done. Um, so um, so who Sun Wealth is, um, and and I don't know if you guys can see my slides, but um, but I'll put up slides and I'll sort of talk through who we are as an organization. The broad vision is that you should be able to walk through your neighborhood, regardless of where you live, and look up, and you should see solar panels on the rooftops of the buildings that you see, on the rooftops of housing, on the rooftop of the library, the schools. Um, you should see it over the parking lots. Um, this is a really good market for solar, you know, it's, it's good spaces that are in the built environment, they're not being used for something else. And, uh, and if we put solar panels there, we could, um, we could supply 25% of the country's power, um, using spaces that wouldn't be used for anything else. Um, but the, um, if you walk through your neighborhood, um, depending on where you live, you may not see that. Um, it wasn't happening. Solar wasn't getting onto those rooftops of, of the schools and the churches and the houses and uh, and all the buildings that you see in your neighborhood. Um, and it wasn't happening because there are some structural barriers to getting that done. Um, one of the biggest is that 
the folks who are financing it are really looking to deploy lots and lots of money into solar and they're looking for the easiest and most lucrative ways to do it. And that forces them to focus, I guess what I would say like upstream, you know, they focus in the more, um, in the more affluent neighborhoods, they focus in, um, you know, at, on big solar fields or huge utility scale projects um, benefiting, you know, S&P 500 companies who are really easy to underwrite. Those are great places to do solar and that's important. Um, but uh, but we need to get it everywhere. Um, and uh, and Sunwealth set out to um, to finance those projects that weren't getting done, in particular in communities where they could really use the, the clean energy, the clean air, um, the savings and the jobs that solar can create the most. Um, and uh, and our natural partner was conscious capitalists um, or impact investors, um, folks who could see the value um, in where you create solar as well as uh, as the amount of solar that you create and who could see the value um, in partnering with all those community based businesses and individuals and organizations and saw a a, a I guess saw a value in the social return that you create by bringing economic benefit to all the uh, all the types of businesses and organizations in your community. So what we do as an organization um, is we raise capital from investors, um, conscious capitalist investors who are thinking not just about the uh, the financial bottom line of their investments, but also about the impact bottom line. Um, we put that money to work in community-based projects, um, small-scale projects in the built environment. Um, we partner with local solar developers and installers um, because we really believe in keeping the jobs and revenues local. Um, and uh, and we, we build these projects, put them into work, um, and, uh, and as they generate power, we get paid for the, um, for the power that they generate by our, our customers, our, our partners, who are either the, the rooftop hosts of the buildings, um, who you know, own the building and have solar panels on their roof, and, uh, or, um, or com in community-based solar projects, it's often a customer someplace else, a local nonprofit that's buying into the power or an individual who's buying some of the power. Um, what our customers get from us, um, if it's a building owner, they get solar on their roof and it doesn't cost them anything. And we own and operate the systems. We're sort of leasing the building from them, owning and operating the systems. Um, and they also get clean power at a discount from what they would otherwise be paying the utility. Um, often that discount is you know, 25% or more off of their electric bills um, over the life of the system. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and, and uh, our investors, um, get the, I, I guess I'd say, you know, they get like a, it's almost like a dividend is the way my mom describes it. You know, they, they invest their money with us. They get a fixed income return um, as we're getting paid back from the electricity. And they get to know that their, their investment, what's paying them that money is, um, is also providing savings for community-based businesses um, that are, uh, that are delivering services in, in our communities. Um, and particularly to, um, yeah, to our most vulnerable um, people and populations. Okay, uh, I think I covered all the stuff here. I mean, so we've been around for a while. Um, we're a B corporation. We're also a public benefit corporation in terms of our structure. Um, and uh, yeah, and we've been getting positive attention for our work. Um, okay, uh, this slide just shows the different types of projects that we've done. You know, at this point we have, um, we have been in business for about seven years. We've raised uh, close to $100 million and put it to work in over 500 solar projects across the country. Um, the impact you can see across the, um, the right-hand side of the screen, I think the important stuff that I'll, um, that I'll call out is that for $100 million invested, we've created what is $50 million, will be $50 million in lifetime savings for our customers. So roughly 50 cents of savings for customers um, per dollar invested. Um, also in that return for, uh, for investment um, that goes to our partners, uh, for, every, um, for every dollar that we invest, we're paying 80 cents of it to local solar developers and installers. So when we talk about creating jobs and revenues for those local businesses that we're partnering with um, and helping them do what they do, um, that's, that's what we're talking about. Um, and, uh, and, you know, 40, 41% of our products are in low and moderate income communities. Um, and 
our partners pay us for electricity and um, and that's allowed us to deliver targeted returns to our investors um, for at this point 31 quarters and counting. Okay, so this just basically says, you know, we've been able to grow and we've been able to attract investment um, from a really broad group of folks, um, including, you know, Connecticut Green Bank, David's organization, um, a bunch of well-known impact investors who you can see there. Um, but the bread and butter of our business is, um, is actually individual investors. Um, we have more than 400 individual investors who put money to work with us. Um, the, uh, the little charts at the bottom, which are pretty small, um, but basically what they show is we've been able to grow as an organization, um, that's the left-hand side, um, in a five-year period in which commercial solar, which you can see on the right-hand side, has been pretty stagnant. Um, and, uh, and that's because the market that we're operating in and the partners that we're working with are, are really, you know, it's ripe for um, for folks to be getting involved in and in doing this work. Um, and that little upward arrow that you see in the right hand chart um, shows the projections for the next five years. Um, this is a market that's going to explode, thanks in part, and we'll talk about this a little later, to the Inflation Reduction Act and some of the climate provisions that are part of that. Um, okay, my favorite part. Um, of all this is to talk about some of the projects that we do. So these last two slides just show a couple of examples of, um, of our projects in action. Go ahead to the next one. Um, if my Aunt Lindy were here, um, she would be excited to see me talking about the Tyler. Um, this is in East Haven, Connecticut. Um, it's a, a project we did with wind development um, and, uh, and also partnered with Sunlight Solar based in New Haven and uh, an American microgrid. Um, this was the site of the former East Haven High School. Um, I have a young woman on my team who, uh, who grew up swimming there um, and, uh, and was really excited. Um, the, the high school has actually been converted to, into a, a 70 unit mixed income senior housing development. Um, and uh, and wind development did an amazing job with this. They, uh, they built it using passive house design um, which I'm seeing Gavin nodding, um, you know, is a, is a standard for construction. That means it's very green design and solar was part of that design. Um, I like the fact that in addition to the residents having solar panels on their building, um, it's going to save the apartment building um, $87,000 over the life of the system. Um, this is meaningful money that they can use to pay for resident services. They can use for other stuff. Um, and that's, you know, that's a really important part of our model is that if we are saving organizations money, that's money they can put to work in, in other things. Um, um, Cardinal Tongue Academy in Stanford, Connecticut, another project that just recently came online. Um, again, that one's going to deliver a whole bunch of savings for the, uh, the bottom line of the organization over its lifetime. Um, we worked on Cardinal Tongue with, uh, with Green Earth Energy. They're based in East Windsor. Um, and, uh, and I actually think the next two projects are also projects that we did with Green Earth. Um, boop, boop, boop. Um, one of them is Connecticut Football Club. Um, they're based in Bethany, Connecticut. It's girls soccer. Um, this is the first time we've ever done, been asked to do solar in, um, in the shape of initials so that you could do a flyby and, uh, and see it. It's a little funny. I, I feel like there are some solar nerds who would say we were really not using the full space as well as we could. Um, but, uh, but it's enough to provide all the power for the, uh, for the soccer club, um, which does girls soccer. Go girls soccer. Um, and we'll deliver to the club. Um, about $177,000 in lifetime savings. Um, and then Laurel Brook Farm in East Canaan. Does anybody know Laurel Brook, Laurel Brook Farm? Um, family owned farm, David does, um, because this is a project that we did with, uh, with Connecticut Green Bank. Um, we, put, um, we put solar on, there's the dairy barn and then there's the cow, there's the cow barn. Maybe one is for milking and one is where the cows actually live. I'm not, David, you know? Nod, no, okay, um, but uh, but you know, family farm operation is uh, is tough work to do, and if you're saving um, three hundred and seventy thousand dollars over the thirty year life of the system, that's that's meaningful money that you can use to take care of the cows. Um, I'll stop at that point. Um, but uh, but the key takeaways from my perspective are uh, are clean energy is worth investing in. Community based clean energy is really worth investing in. And, uh, and that, you know, this is just one example of the ways that you can get involved. Um, and David, we'll talk about some more. Thanks, Jess. What a great uh, couple of stories there. And I really like the, and the lifetime savings is something you don't hear often enough because it, it's real money. You know, I'm sure those um, projections are based on, um, you know, that those prices are gonna go up a lot too in the near future. So, um, 
so thanks, Jess, and perhaps David, you might want to jump in. Okay. Um, and thank you all for, for having me here. I'll tell you a little bit about how I got involved in the field. Um, and, you know, being being here at Conscious Capitalism, especially kind of neat, neat for me because I read the book Conscious Capitalism um, the summer before I started grad school. Um, and it actually really had a, a deep impact on me and affected kind of the specialization I chose in grad school. Um, I studied social impact, innovation, and investment. Uh, a lot of words that basically just mean trying to figure out how we can use business and private capital along with effective policy to create social impact. Um, and that really kind of led me to, to the Green Bank. So i um, very excited to, to be here and, and really value the Conscious Capitalism mission and excited to tell you a little bit about the Green Bank. I'm a manager on the clean energy finance team here at the Green Bank. So we were the nation's very first Green Bank uh, established back in 2011. We're a quasi-public state agency of the state of Connecticut. Um, and our mission at the bottom there is to confront climate change by increasing and accelerating investment into Connecticut's green economy to create more resilient, healthier, and equitable communities. Um, and all of our work is guided by our vision of a, a planet protected by the love of humanity. What I like to describe about the Green Bank is um, there's a lot of folks in the climate space that are doing technological innovation. So they are making better solar panels, more efficient wind turbines, new battery storage technologies, um, cleaner aviation fuels, all these exciting new technologies. Um, but you know, once we figure out the technologies, we also need to innovate in terms of how do we finance these projects? How do we create business models that actually provide a good return for investors and actually get these projects done? Um, and that's kind of how the Green Bank comes in. We're trying to innovate and show the private sector how this works and really kind of create a, a strong marketplace uh, in the green economy. Um, so with that, I'll start to talk a little bit about some of the work we've already done. So we've done um, really awesome work in residential solar and, and now starting to do work in battery storage. Um, you know, when we started our, our residential solar incentive program, um, there was original stake goal of about 30 megawatts and we blew through that. Um, and what we did was basically provided incentives um, to folks wanting to build solar on their homes. Um, and at the time, you know, the residential solar market was a pretty nascent industry, um, pretty small. Um, but over the past, getting close to eight or nine years now, um, the program actually just finished last year. Um, we blew past that 30 megawatt goal and ended up fi um, funding and helping support 380 megawatts. Um, may not know what that means, but um, more than 46,000 homes in Connecticut got solar because of this program. Um, so it's really awesome work. Um, and you know we were able to now exit the market because the private sector is doing this work now. There's a strong residential solar market um, that we helped create with this incentive program. And you know the, the best case scenario for the Green Bank is when um, you know the private market is, is doing enough by itself. They are going out there and selling residential solar like crazy. And so we're really proud of that. And so now our focus on the residential side is moving towards battery storage and how can we incentivize um, battery storage in Connecticut and really create a market there. Um, so what we've done now is created a, a new incentive program um, with batteries. Batteries provide a really great benefit to our electric grid, but it's hard for battery owners. They rarely are able to monetize or take advantage of um, you know, the benefits that having a, a battery creates. Um, so we created an incentive structure where um, there's an upfront incentive um, for, to help lower the cost of buying a battery. And that incentive is higher for underserved communities or low income customers. Um, and in addition, battery owners can get paid for those days when peak of summer and everyone has their ACs on high and the electrical grid is at its maximum capacity. And usually the answer when we hit one of these peak days is to turn on a new, is to turn on like a natural gas plant. We call them peaker plants. Um, but instead, if we have our batteries all charged up, when those big peak moments happen, when everyone's using a ton of electricity, the batteries can discharge their power. So we can use the, the, the power that hopefully it comes from solar, or at least just came from the grid before, um, and we don't have to turn on those fossil fuel plants. Um, so now battery owners in the state of Connecticut will get an incentive for that, and uh, program's just starting to roll out, and we're really excited to see more battery storage in Connecticut. So 
Uh, that's what we've done on the residential side, and we're really proud of it. So another way we're trying to, um, you know, accelerate clean energy in the state and find those projects or, or industries that have kind of been left behind is our marketplace assistance program. And this is really where we've gone out and helped um, state agencies and towns in Connecticut and some nonprofits um, do solar. This is really hard for the private marketplace often to, to make these projects happen because there's a lot of extra work. You have to go to city council meetings. You have to go through a bunch of state contracting provisions. There's a lot of bureaucracy. There's a fair amount of red tape and it's a lot of extra work. Um, and so the private, private market doesn't always have the patience to, to get these projects done. But we're willing to kind of roll up our sleeves, do some of the, the dirty work of working with city councils and all of the permitting and, and all, all of the bureaucratic processes that we have to get done to help a town or a state agency put solar on their roof. And what you see here is one of the results. Um, this is a, a school in Manchester, Connecticut that got solar. So um, this is another way where we're, we're trying to push the market forward and uh, democratize clean energy. You know, in addition to accelerating clean energy, we wanna make sure that the benefits of the green economy are accessible to everyone. Um, and so we created what we call our green liberty bonds. Um, this was really inspired by the war bonds of the 1940s when more than 60% of the US population bought a war bond um, to help the US face this huge threat um, in World War II. Um, and we see, you know, the modern day existential threat is climate change. And so we wanted to create a vehicle or a vessel for everyday Americans, everyday Connecticut residents to buy a green liberty bond to be a part of the fight against climate change. Um, and so we created our green liberty bonds for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, they were backed by actually the proceeds from all of those residential solar um, systems that we had uh, helped incentivize and, and make happen. Um, and so, you know, the last round of Green Liberty Bonds, we, we sold about 25 million, but we had $100 million of offers for these bonds. So we saw a really great turnout and a lot of interest um, from everyday folks and institutional investors who, who wanted to invest in a, a Green Bond certified investment. Um, but unfortunately, we tried to get the price down as much as we possibly could, but um, the municipal bond market, the lowest you can get a bond is $1,000. Um, so that means that to buy one, you have to have $1,000 in a broker, which is still out of reach for a lot of folks who might be interested in investing in clean energy. So um, with that, we created our Green Liberty Notes. Yeah, so our Green Liberty Notes, um, you can invest in them for as little as $100. Uh, they work like a CD. Um, you put your money in, after a year, you get your money back with interest. Um, our current interest rate is three and a half percent. It compares very favorably to your average um, CD. Um, and on top of that, we had Kestrel verifiers come in, designate this a green bond, verify that um, the proceeds were, were helping fight climate change. Um, and the proceeds that are backing these Green Liberty Notes are our SBEA loans, that stands for Small Business Energy Advantage. Um, these are loans that are provided by um, the state utilities um, to small businesses or towns who want to do energy efficiency measures. And the great thing about these loans, and, and again, kind of talking about some of that financial innovation is that they can be repaid directly on the customer's utility bill instead of getting a separate bill. Um, and so usually they often, they pay for themselves. They also come with uh, an upfront incentive to help lower the cost. Um, and so they really lower the barrier of entry to small businesses who want to do energy efficiency measures, better lighting, new HVAC systems, um, all these potential improvements that could save them money. Um, these loans really help lower the barrier. Um, and then the Green Bank actually um, owns these loans um, and earns the revenue from them. And, and that revenue is what we, what we use to pay back the interest on the Green Liberty Notes. Um, and on the left side of the screen here, you can see a little bit about um, an example of one of the great projects, right? An SBA loan saved a family farm $85,000 in annual utility bills, um, reducing lifetime carbon emissions by 237 tons, which is pulled into 33 cars from the road. So a lot of great impact. And, um, you know, 
you can spend, you know, you can say 15% on car insurance in 15 minutes, you can uh, earn a, a, a return while supporting Connecticut's green economy in about 10 minutes. So uh, if you go to the next slide, you can just go to greenlibertynotes.com. Our current raise is open. We do these about once every quarter. Um, like I said, for as little as $100, you can, you can invest in, in the Connecticut green economy. Um, so with that, I will um, end my portion and could answer questions. But uh, once again, I appreciate everyone uh, giving me the time and really appreciated the opportunity to, to share. David, the, um, the Green Liberty Notes, there's like a priority for Connecticut residents too, right? Yeah, so there's a priority for um, the lower denomination investments. So um, if you go online and you see that it looks like they're completely filled out, um, the, the kind of maximum raise amount is $250,000. Um, don't worry, um, because if we get more than $250,000, um, we have an allocation method where first and foremost, we're going um, to, we're first and foremost, we're going to accept um, investments of $1,000 or less from Connecticut, and then investments of $1,000 or less from across the country, and then we'll, we'll kind of go up by amount invested. So our goal is really to provide an investment vehicle for um, folks who don't have a thousand dollars or more to, to spend. So those folks are protected in our rates. Um, so if that means that some people who invest twenty thousand dollars are only able to invest ten thousand, or have to have their investment scaled back, so be it. But um, our goal with this raise is really to um, provide an opportunity for for folks who don't have an opportunity to really buy green bonds regularly. So thanks for mentioning that. That yeah, Jess, that's we, really important. We talk about democratizing solar investment. And, uh, and I think both David's organization and my organization think about it in two ways, right? Like we think about it in terms of getting solar into the hands of, and, and solar savings into the hands of organizations that can really use it. Um, and then we talk about it in terms of making it possible for everybody to feel like they have a stake in our clean energy economy. And that's, that's as investors as well. And a lot of investment opportunities out there are only open to folks that have a whole lot of money. Um, this is this is really groundbreaking to have something like this that's available. That's just, that is just like a CD. Um, and, uh, and so super cool. And I love that there's like a Connecticut priority. Yeah, you've really thought this through. Um, I see digital hands up, which is great, but we have a question in the chat. How does Connecticut compare to surrounding states in percentage of houses with solar? Yeah, I don't I have the exact numbers, but um, I know we're doing really well. Um, I believe, yeah, I don't have the exact stats, but we're we're in the top two or three, I think, for um, so top like five solar density. Five. It's like it's mm -hmm. like um, amount of solar per per person. Um, we're right there near the top. So there are some states that have more, but in terms of um, you know solar per population, we're we're really close to the top. So very proud. Oh, of per capita. Per capita, that's Thanks. the word, man. Yes, per capita. <laughs> Kathy. Hi, um, I'm so sorry I was uh, uh, late. I, um, Kathy Sane, I own a manufacturing company um, located in Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, and uh, belong to a lot of um, different organizations that support manufacturing and education mostly in the state. But one of the um, recent surveys that Manufacturer CT did for their Government Affairs Committee that asked for the most important issues of concern with manufacturers, the top issue was um, the well, top issue was supply, uh, workforce supply, and the second issue was the cost of um, electricity in Connecticut. And um, there are manufacturers who are seriously looking at leaving the state. Uh, manufacturers who have multiple locations are adding to their out-of-state locations. Even New York has lower rates than we do. And um, <clears throat> it's very frustrating for us when we have conversations with Electura and other groups um, because you know it, it just feels like there's there's not, there are no easy fixes. And um, most of the fixes are, are gonna take a long time to really scale. Um, and I'm also a big Deming, uh, Dr. W. E. Deming, devote. Um, and I like to think of things in terms of systems. And I appreciate the 
piece of this that tries to help um, you know the um, people who don't have a lot of resources. But in my perspective, it's like how do we, how do you scale this and focus on where you're going to get the biggest overall benefit from the buck? And when I talk. To when the manufacturers were on the call with Pura and talking about solar and everything else, a number of them were saying that the investment versus payback, um, you know, doesn't work when we have so many other things competing for our funds. You know, we're constantly trying to reinvest in our our people and equipment and to, in order to be competitive. And um, I'm just wondering. Um, you know, that, that to me seems like, you know, the, the large buildings with big flat roofs is certainly, yeah. you know, the schools and um, buildings, but it's very much the manufacturing. No, you need, yeah, you need those big flat roofs. Absolutely. I, I think and, it's really important. And, um, you know, and even if it's just supporting, like, somehow spending the money to recoat the roofs in white. Um, but um, what what's out there to support manufacturers so that you can get because you're going to need an awful lot of houses to really power those batteries and and make it worthwhile. Um, what what can you do? I'll, I'll let David answer the question from the Connecticut perspective. But just like broadly, you're absolutely right. Like it's got to be all the roofs. It can't just be the um, the little houses and stuff. That those flat manufacturing roofs. Like I, I live in Boston, and I if you fly into Logan Airport, and I'm sure it's the same with Bradley or Tweed, right? You see all of these different buildings, and you you say to yourself, "Good God! Like these are all places where we could have these little tiny power plants um, generating energy." And and if you can do it in a way that is like. Uh, uh, lowering the expenses in your in your bottom line like that that's a really good thing um and so i would say like you you might want to look into third party ownership of your systems like like you would do with a sunwealth or you could do it with a connecticut green bank or somebody else um because then what you get and and for our customers you know it's not just the churches and schools who can't afford it it's it's also the boston properties of the world or the wind developments of the world who say like look it's it's not how we're going to allocate the resources it's more efficient for us to have someone else own and operate the solar system and uh and we just want to like know that it's there know that it's reducing our costs and then for some folks like boston properties it's like oh let's also make it a community solar project so that we're putting some of the um power that we're generating toward the homeless shelters in our community or or low-income residents in the communities where our employees live um so that's a it's definitely a, a possibility that you can do the other thing the schools with the commitment that any savings are oh, right, um, right. No, are exactly. statutorily co committed to being redirected to the classroom mm -hmm. Exactly. No, absolutely. And um, and I guess the other thing I would say, the other way I've seen manufacturing organizations and others use their, like, use the solar to their financial advantage um, is you can do tax credit investing, right? Like you can invest in the tax credit piece of the um, of the party. And we do, do a whole separate call about that some other time. Um, but essentially, you know, you can make a tax deductible investment, you know, where you get to claim, it's basically, it's like, it's going to be like 30% of the value of the project um, as a tax credit. Um, and, uh, and so you essentially are, you know, getting a huge chunk of your investment back in the form of tax credit. So, so if you have taxable income, like that's, a, that's another thing to look at. And you don't necessarily have to look at, at it as paying the whole upfront cost. Right. David can talk about the specifics Thanks. of like the loans that and, you know. and to that point, you know, um, I just saw Eleanor nodding her head. And so, uh, um, you know, I am a member of Manufacturer CT and um, a couple other manufacturing associations. And that certainly would be an interesting um, topic for a call. Yeah. And, so, and I mean, the thing to think about is, um, is some of it depends on the age of the roof and what the roof can take. And so you have to sort of think about that and time it the right way. Um, but but it's easy enough. Like if you were to call us up, you know, some, someone on our team could eyeball the roof or any solar developer, right? Could like go on Google Maps, eyeball the roof, check and see what um, what utility area you're in and stuff and get you like a, a quick math on, on what's it going to cost to do and what might you be able to save. 
I'll also but tell you another is, thing that you're up against, yeah. and that is the there's a church that owns the building that my business, so we're we're lease a uh, tenant, yeah. and they put solar on the roof probably nine months ago. Easy started working on it over a year ago, and the permitting piece with the hmm. city has been holding it up for I would say probably five months. And and there, there needs to be um, some type of outreach to like the mayor's office, um, you know, uh, and at the state level to the state where um, they put some pressure on these offices that are frankly bullies. That's that's really so. David, how would you, David, how would you speak to the permitting piece and also what what was just discussed? Yeah, well, unfortunately, I don't have great answers on the permitting piece. Um, you know, we share the frustration there. Um, you know, your your main question, though, is one, you know, we love to hear because this is, you know, really where some of the financial innovation can help out. Um, and these are like the the, chat, the problems we're always trying to solve. Um, you know, I I can't have too much effect on what Pura does. And, um, you know, we hope electricity rates come down, but there is no near term solution, um, though I know there are good folks working on that. Um, you know, the best the best way to do this is to go solar. Um, but obviously, like you mentioned, there's challenges in like putting that money down. So that's why, you know, we have our products like Sun Wealth does power purchase agreements where you don't have to put money down. Um, Sun Wealth will own your system and you just pay them for the electricity the system produces and save money that way. So you don't put any money down, you're saving, you're saving money. We also have Which a product. Which would be good called, for a tenant, you know, for somebody yeah. like me, because Otherwise, I'm investing in somebody else's infrastructure and right. the payback doesn't work. I might not be here. Right. Well, that's a question I have. How do you, how do you, um, if, because what I've seen is there's owners and then there's the, 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 the leasers and the leasers are paying the electrical bill. The owner has to approve and put up the solar projects and uh, they don't see the benefits really from it, except actually they have a green building, they have, you know, they, there's a lot of other benefits, but not directly in it. And uh, so I wonder, how do you close that gap between the owners and then the, the leases of the, of the properties? Any good financial ways to do that? Because I think that opens up a lot. I know just, uh, just right now, I know, you know, someone that has a lot of building space, but it's all leased out. And I've talked to them about Green Bank and they're like, well, you know, they're, it's not, it doesn't get to the top of their list uh, because they don't see the benefit. And the other thing they worry about is with flat roofs, you're always worrying about um, penetrating the, the seal because they're so notorious for leaking and everything else. So that's another owner concern. Yeah, Simon, I mean, without you your hand up. Mm. Simon, we'd like to invite you in. Hi, thanks for doing this. This is this is wonderful. Um, my I, my question is for both of you. Uh, I'm curious about from a community development standpoint uh, and community engagement. How does that work within both of your organizations? Is it direct? Do you have internal direct outreach? Are people coming to you? What's the what's the market like? We do a little bit of both. Um, we try and, and market our products um, the best we can and try to be out there, um, you know, do panels like these, um, you know, have conversations. I'm not on our, our marketing team, but they do a really great job of trying to, to get the word out. Um, and we also, you know, we have relationships with contractors who will go out and, and find and do their own sales and then come to us to finance projects. So um, it's a little bit of our own and a little bit of projects that come to us. Yeah, I, uh, I I like to say it takes a village to build an impactful solar project. Um, and uh, and I think that speaks to what Kathy was saying about like the permitting challenges and the roles that you need to play in advocacy there. Um, I think it also actually speaks to what David was saying, um, da David Reitz was saying, or Reitz was saying beforehand about, um, about the challenges with like somebody owns the building, somebody else is the tenant, the tenant's paying for the electricity, et cetera. Like oftentimes you have to have a lot of different folks working together. Um, as an example of um, of the community development stuff that uh, that uh, that Simon was asking about, um, 
we look at all the different models. You know, we have uh, nonprofit partners that we work with. We'll partner with, for example, here in Boston, the city of Cambridge um, to reach out to their residents and let them know that they're eligible. First of all, if they're low income residents, they're eligible to pay a lower rate to the utility based on their income status. Um, and then they're also eligible to sign up for community solar and just automatically get 25% off their, their electric bill. Um, we've worked with um, a food incubator business here in, uh, in Massachusetts where we, uh, we um, uh, put solar on the roof there. And then they basically, like it was enough to offset the, um, the electric bills for all of the common tenant areas, which is what the tenants cover. And they were distributing to it. Um, we, uh, we have also worked with homeless services organizations um, or groups that are providing temporary shelter and or affordable housing and where the tenants actually pay their electric bills. And, and there it comes down to like working with the CFO of the organization to figure out how to take something that's coming into the, um, into the bottom line of the, uh, the organization that owns the building and then disperse it to the, the different tenants in, in some fashion. But you have to kind of, you have to be willing to get creative. And I think what many businesses do uh, is they'll say, okay, my, my work stops with putting the solar on the rooftop. Um, there's there's no money for me to make in in doing all that extra work to figure out like the, the great way to distribute the benefits. Um, we try to work with partners, um, community organizations, and um, and to pick up partners that we're working with who really value that that extra work that we and they need to do to to distribute the benefits. That's a good question, Simon. It doesn't just happen. I mean that that's the thing, right? Is is if you, and, and that's the reason why I am so excited about working in this space right now is we have this limited window right now. Like we are building a new clean energy economy. We're gonna transition to clean energy away from fossil fuels. And this is the moment when we get to decide who, who has a stake in that future. And so the investments that we make right now, the investments that the green banks of the world make right now, um, that, that that's what's gonna, and, and the way we guide those investments, who we say gets a, a seat and a voice at the table, that's what's gonna um, dictate what the future looks like um, a generation from now. Yeah, I have a quick question. So I've got um, a shareholder in a, uh, a dry cleaning business that just uh, bought in, in June. And, uh, so it, it's a building from 1999, it's 5,000 square feet. And so I actually called Green Bank, uh, Brian Garcia introduced me to Peter. We, we uh, have an assessment being done right now and uh, we're the owners and tenants. So it's, it's actually, a, it's a good connection there. And they've looked at it. And what, what's, what's interesting is we can change the LED lighting we can, there's all these uh, hot air pipes going through that need to be insulated. We have, um, we have uh, another uh, uh, compressed air that can be more efficient, heat traps. And we can get financing at 2.99% for it. And because there's multiple uh, different vectors, savings is, uh, uh, the utility will contribute 45 to 65% of the project cost. But the one thing that they've, they've been kind of not saying that they're going to do, which is surprise, is the solar work. And um, I don't know if it's because of the permitting or whatnot, but it's, the, it's 5,000 square feet. It's got more space than the houses that I saw. We have room for batteries if we need that. But it's like coming back as something not interesting. So I'm wondering if what the challenge is, if there, or you could potentially say what it is, if it's the amount of uh, wattage that it's generating, or I, I guess I'm, I'm just uh, wondering on that. But I would say from a green greening the the building it's 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 a wonderful project that's going to provide good uh financial incentive to the share our shareholders which i'm one of them uh but this is one thing that's not working out i i'm just curious if there's ideas why it, it wouldn't yeah I, I mean i don't know project specific often sometimes it's it's roofs right if, if a roof is in not great condition or if it's an older roof um you know you are putting solar panels which can be fairly heavy on them um, and so we got to make sure that the roof is, is stable enough. That's usually the problem when we see this. Um, though with our seat-based financing, we are able to 
um, to finance roof replacement as well. Um, there's just a requirement that the savings of the entire project is enough to cover the investment dollars. Um, and usually usually that works out to, to cover most, if not all, of the roofing costs. So I'm not exactly sure what's, what's specific about this one, but I would think that we could do it. Um, it could be actually kind of a, a two different types of financing. Um, the 2.99, I think, is our Smarty loans, which are um, for energy efficiency projects, like you said, um, and you have those, those great incentives. Um, and then CPACE would be one where you kind of essentially pay it back via your property taxes. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what's um, happening with the solar. Happy to, to talk to Peter and others, but usually it's, it's roof stuff often that, that would stop um, solar, but don't know the specifics, but would love okay. to would love to make that work for you because um, love to see you have a full green building plus solar and batteries and all of the above. Yeah, me too. Okay, all right, thank you for that. Yeah. Wayne, did you want to give it a shot? Yeah, can you can you hear me now? Uh, yeah. I just I just want to high five uh, Jess. Uh, I don't know if you remember the project, the clock tower in in Norwalk. Uh, you were one of the best companies we've ever worked with, and we we put up about a hundred. Uh, I swear he's systems. not a plan. I, I actually I had a picture of the clock tower project in my uh, in my deck, and then was futzing with stuff, and it came out. But that's, it's a great project. You want to talk about it? Uh, well, it was a really old building, and and if the key was getting the structure right, but it worked out fine. Uh, no, I also wanted to mention uh, for uh, David, uh, you know, it's not just batteries that are coming up. The EV cars, like like my my car has a battery that's seven, yeah, you know, seven times bigger than my backup for my solar system on my house. So those need to be. That needs to be figured in as soon as possible. And uh, the other thing is, uh, the uh, we need an incentive somehow for parking lots because those are sitting all over the place also. And uh, you know, it's something that that really needs to be uh, thought about. I, mean, I think Massachusetts has a bonus for that, but Connecticut doesn't. A hundred percent. Parking lots are a terrific, um, a terrific place to be doing solar. And I like, I would love to see solar on all the parking lots. And I think, uh, David, you might be able to speak to this a little more. The um, Connecticut may not have an incentive for it, but the uh, the new Inflation Reduction Act does. And so, um, so I think there's there's possibility there. Um, I, I want to also point out, and I put it in the chat, but uh, but the clock tower project it was Sunwell, and also it was Green Bank. You guys were the ones that introduced us to it. So. Great project. Awesome. So you just, might mention that uh, the uh, the reduction, the Inflation Reduction Act, now also gives a direct payment to nonprofits and schools for that thirty percent. That's right. So instead of taking a tax, you just they'll just get a, get a check for that much. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, what are the things in the Inflation Reduction Act sure. that can, things that can contribute to? Uh, I mean, we're a lot of business kind of here, so I, I, I'm just curious on that. There's a lot of great things. Yeah. So um, first is there's an investment tax credit if you do solar or for wind or other renewables, but usually if you're talking to business, it's going to be solar. Um, so it increased that from 26% to 30%. So for example, if you got like a CPACE loan with the Green Bank, um, you would basically get 30% of the cost of the project back in the first year as a tax credit, which is, that's a huge sum of money. You also get benefits from being able to depreciate um, the, the amount of the, the cost of the solar system, um, which is a, another fair amount of tax benefits over um, six years. Um, then you'd also just um, have your, your yearly payments to the Green Bank, which would be less than, um, less than the savings you're getting from solar. So it's cash flow positive year one and you have this bigger upfront incentive. So that's been great, but there's also some great um, adders to the investment tax credit now. So um, if your project is like in Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, this is what the legislation defined as an energy community. Um, and that includes everything from like solar at brownfield sites to solar in um, communities that formerly had a coal uh, or fossil fuel plants, or have um, you know higher 
than average um, unemployment, things like that. There's, there's adders for low income communities. There's a bonus if you use US made goods. Um, and we're also requiring that all of these projects are done using um, prevailing wages and apprenticeship hours. So not only are we encouraging, you know, clean energy in the places that need it most, energy communities, low income communities, um, but we're also requiring now that to get this tax credit, you have to pay the workers building it a good wage. Um, so we're making sure that the green jobs are good jobs as well. So a lot of juicy things in there. Um, you now get a tax credit for energy storage. Used to be you can only get it if you paired it with a solar system. Now, if you just want to get batteries by themselves, you get that tax credit as well. So I could keep going. I'll give Jess a chance to, to jump in and maybe add some things. I, I think I hit some of the, the key items there, but there's a lot of great things in that inflation reduction. Uh, no, David, you, you got it all. I mean, I think the, the cool thing about it is the Inflation Reduction Act takes the good things about the, um, the federal policy around renewable energy and it like it institutes them, like puts them in place and keeps them like the tax credit for the next 10 years, which is huge. Um, and then the other thing is it adds all these new incentives that are really focused on getting solar into all the places that we need it. So I'm focused on solar because that's what my company is focused on, but clean energy in general in the places that we need it. And so there are these really interesting op opportunities to layer um, to layer the additional adders in. Um, you know, you can also the um, we're exploring with a lot of folks like the Boston properties of the world or whatever who have buildings. Um, making the projects community solar projects so that you get an additional adder for that so that it's also benefiting your community. And I guess there's like, there's the there's the financial benefit that you get. And then there's also the the karmic benefit of yeah. providing solar on folks. folks that that's right, you can't, and that's priceless, right, Jess? And it's, well, yeah, I mean, I think yeah. if, if you can do it and still have the financial return, like mm. what, why wouldn't you, right? Well, thank you so much. Uh, for coming today, Jess and David. Great to hear your stories, your victories, some of your challenges. And I think I've learned a lot today. And by the way, 3.5%, David, is, is a whole lot better than any CD. So, uh, you know, that's a solid product right there. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing. And um, we hope we can see you at a, an event in the near future. Thanks all. Great to be here. Thank you guys. It was great.